Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this last of a three-part series on mitral stenosis, we cover the final associated complication, atrial fibrillation. Of course, atrial fibrillation is common and seen in many other clinical situations, but I've chosen to review it here because it is so important and I wanted to pull it out from the other rhythm lectures. And just for orientation, we are reviewing complications of atrial enlargement in the setting of mitral stenosis. And as I note, this will be a brief review or summary of the key features for the USMLE Step 1 exam. This is not intended to be a comprehensive overview of atrial fibrillation. That is fodder for Step 2 and Step 3 exams. So first and foremost, you won't have to make a primary diagnosis of AFib on Step 1. That is, they assume you can identify AFib and then proceed to ask you a set of derivative questions. Many times they will just describe the rhythm as irregularly irregular, but you are just as likely going to see a characteristic tracing. So you should be familiar with the rhythm tracings. This is a tracing I would put in your collection of images to know for step one. Do note, students are expert at imagining P waves. The coarse fibrillatory waves can appear to have P wave morphology, so don't look at them in an irregularly irregular tracing. Instead, you should focus on the irregularity of the RR intervals. If you look at these, you'll have no trouble recognizing the underlying rhythm disturbance. Insofar as a straightforward but tricky derivative, be aware that the A wave in the jugular venous pressure curve corresponds to atrial contraction. In AFib, the atrium does not contract, it only quivers, so there will be a loss of the characteristic A wave. This is a stupid and irrelevant fact, but it happens to underscore the pathophysiologic state. As a result, this turns out to be a good board's question, and now you know. A second easy derivative, once it is highlighted for you, is what determines the ventricular rate in a patient with atrial fibrillation. Recall the atrium quivers at a rate of about 400 beats per minute, so why doesn't the ventricle pump at that rate? Answer, the AV node and specifically its refractory period. So the ventricular rate is governed by the number and rate of impulses transmitted through the AV node. Boom, derivative number two. Let's keep going, this is fun. Okay, so those are the major players regarding the rhythm. So the next step is understanding the complications. And to be clear, they'll either show you a rhythm strip or describe a patient with that irregularly irregular heart rate. Then comes the physiologic derivatives. In this instance, I'm showing you a patient whose heart rate is about 150 beats per minute. That's quick. At that rate, ventricular filling is compromised. There is insufficient time for diastolic filling. The result is pulmonary venous congestion. That is congestive heart failure. The problem is compounded if they have comorbid heart disease such as those listed. What these conditions share in common is dependence on adequate ventricular filling to maintain cardiac output. They are generically described as being preload dependent. For your purposes, if they offer a patient with comorbid cardiac disease who goes into rapid AFib and develops congestive heart failure, the cause will be loss of preload or diastolic filling. I know this is a complex concept, especially as you struggle to appreciate preload, but you can anticipate this type of question describing the pathophysiologic consequences associated with rapid AFib. Truth told, this is a common clinical occurrence for decompensated congestive heart failure and certainly has implications for myocardial ischemia as well. That is, the coronary vessels filled during diastole. In fast AFib, there is insufficient time to perfuse those vessels. Much more straightforward is the issue of systemic embolization. Please note, I said systemic. Got that? Although clinically, our focus is on stroke reduction strategies, emboli can travel anywhere the blood flows, so you'll need to be on the lookout for the coagulative necrosis associated with the phrase wedge-shaped infarct of a solid organ. Acute cut ischemia is another favorite derivative. That is, they'll describe a patient with palpitations or who is on digoxin for an abnormal heart rhythm and develops acute abdominal pain with bloody diarrhea. They are noted with segmental ischemia. What was the underlying cause? Answer atrial fibrillation. This component of atrial fibrillation, and rheumatic fever for that matter as presented in part two, make them both test favorites at the NBME. Any condition that crosses organ systems and subdivisions are great fodder on test day. And I won't beat this slide to death, but it is a beauty. I've highlighted a wedge-shaped infarction in the patient's left kidney. When you see a lesion like this, the clinician's mind races through the myriad causes of thromboembolism. Choices one through nine are all potential etiologies. Physiologic erythrocytosis is not a hypercoagulable state and did not cause this renal infarction. 
So be on the lookout for wedge-shaped infarctions in the setting of atrial fibrillation. Let's move ahead to treatment. Of note, I did not mention evaluation of the patient with AFib. From the board's point of view, hyperthyroidism is the only secondary cause to be familiar with. This was covered in the thyroid videos and should not be a big ticket item. As far as treatment is concerned, you will not need to make decisions about initiating anticoagulation. However, they will often use AFib as a means of querying you about vitamin K antagonism, that is, treatment and management of warfarin. A classic case would be a patient with AFib starting a medication to prevent clots. 36 hours, they develop a painful echomotic lesion. And there you have it. They used AFib to serve up a question on warfarin-induced skin necrosis. AFib was guilty by association. As far as rate control is concerned, you just need to be aware of those agents which can cause prolongation of the AV node refractory period. Beta blockers and non-hydropyridine calcium channel blockers, such as lutiazem and verapamil, may be used. Note, I am only talking about rate control. The boards does not test you on drugs such as amiodarone and sotalol to maintain sinus rhythm. Let me be clear, however, they will test you on those drugs, but you are not responsible for keeping patients in normal sinus rhythm. Although digoxin doesn't get much clinical play these days, from the board's perspective, it is juicy and offers great opportunity for mischief. So here are the key points. First notice, I've listed an inotropic mechanism of action and chronotropic mechanism of action. The mechanism by which digoxin controls the heart rate in atrial fibrillation is separate and independent of its effect on contractility. The mechanism of rate management with digoxin is through heightened or increased parasympathetic tone. How this is achieved is essentially unknown. You should like unknown mechanisms. That means they won't ask. Just be familiar with this mechanism of action and more importantly how it differs from the inotropic effect of cardiac glycosides. Insofar as inotropy, recall that digoxin binds to and interferes with the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Breaking this into two necessary steps, that means that sodium is not, repeat, not being pumped out of the myocyte. And that brings us to the second step. If sodium is not pumped out or effluxing from the cell, that in turn means the sodium calcium exchanger is not activated. That is, calcium does not need to be pumped out of the cell to restore intracellular sodium concentrations and electrochemical neutrality. The result of this tale is that intracellular concentration of calcium remains elevated with resultant beneficial effects on activity and myosin cross-linking. Bottom line is improved cardiac output with cardiac glycosides. Clinically, this is debatable, but the NBME is testing you on mechanism of action, not clinical trials. If I haven't been sufficiently clear, you need to know mechanism of action of digoxin and how it possesses different inotropic and chronotropic properties. And now we can bring this home. They are also big on the adverse effects of digoxin toxicity. They are unique and characteristic. First and foremost, Dig toxicity questions almost always include a description of visual difficulties. If the NBME is in a good mood on test day, they will describe altered colored perception or yellowish vision along with nausea and vomiting. If they are cranky, they just mention blurring of vision. That said, they will use vision to get into the other derivatives, namely, why they became digitoxic in the first place. Invariably, it is from the concurrent use of medications that impacted renal function or serum potassium levels. So if a patient is on high-dose diuretic and develops hypokalemia, digoxin has a competitive advantage in binding the sodium potassium pump. Digitoxic effects will be observed. The other player will be starting agents such as ACE inhibitors that drop the GFR. A classic scenario will be a patient hospitalized for congestive heart failure who starts both an ACE inhibitor and loop diuretic. One week later, they develop abnormal vision and present in complete heart block. What's up with that? Answer, either high dig level from renal insufficiency or hypokalemia from diuretic and increased digoxin binding. Finally, be aware that dig can cause hyperkalemia through competitive binding of the sodium potassium pump and there is no one characteristic dig toxic heart rhythm. I mention this informationally. It shouldn't be a deal killer on any question. And here is a summary slide material covered in this section. And this concludes our review of mitral stenosis. This was our first example of how they use valvular disorders on the USMLE Step 1 exam. They start with a presentation of an innocent murmur and assume you can identify it, but then the derivatives come fast and furious from any number of directions. So if you love this presentation on mitral stenosis, wait until you hear what they do with mitral regurgitation. And that will do it for this edition of mitral stenosis. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 days in March. Thank you.